warm November day and I was stretched out on a hammock in the backyard of the house I shared in Austin, Texas. At 9 a.m. it was already 60 degrees and I loved it. I habitually took Sunday morning calls on this hammock, the ones from my mom and the rest of my family back in Chicago. I had relocated the previous year but almost didn't go. After a battery of tests, Dr. Weber, our neurologist, laid out my mom's Alzheimer's diagnosis and went through what was to become of our family as my mom's sister, stepdad, and I gathered around him on comfy leather couches. It was a tale like Benjamin Button's where my mom's cognitive ability would reverse until she slowly became not an infant, but catatonic. As we left the office that day, I felt pressure, like we were already on the clock and it was going backwards. I pulled Dr. Weber aside and said, there's no way I can go. I mean, my mom needs me now. How would I ever possibly move? And I'll never forget the way he looked at me in sympathy and said, Julie, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Live your life. You'll know when to come back. So with Dr. Weber's reassurance as my hall passed, I fled. Austin agreed with me, and I settled into these Sunday morning calls as a way to keep in touch with everybody back in Chicago. That day I started with my Aunt Mary and she told, talked about a lunch that she was going to have with my mom later that day. So when my mom called, I was happy to ask her about her day. She had just retired from AT&T where she ran a sales division, but retirement was boring and she was getting restless. I asked her to fill me in on her day and she said, yeah, I went to lunch. And I said, nice, how was it? Thinking she was going to fill me in on my aunts, her younger sisters, Mary and Kathy, but instead she paused, and a silence creeped through the phone. And then she rushed to reply that she had lunch with clients, like I had put her on the spot. And I thought, oh, shit. My mom continued to describe in detail this phantom client lunch, and a chill went down my spine as I noticed a tremble of fear in her own voice. Like someone in a stage play that doesn't remember their lines, my mom was clearly winging it with this story. I know now that lies and cover-up are a routine part of early onset Alzheimer's. My mom was 64. I chatted with my sister Amy that night, because I'm like, was this really happening so fast? You guys just came to visit me in May, and everything was copacetic. Mom knew who I was, you guys could follow conversations, she actually remembered where we had lunch the previous day. And Amy conveyed that, yeah, our mom was having trouble fitting in with her own daily life. And to do so, she was creating situations for herself. According to the executive director of the, the adult daycare that she was in, it was best to not correct her, just to agree with her and be positive. So as my mom started telling us that she had spent the day with her father, who we knew was deceased, uh, our frequent response was, great, how's grandpa? <laughs> and she was delighted to talk about him and tell us about her day. I was back in Chicago by Christmas because I was afraid she's going to forget me. And I also knew I wanted to support her because Alzheimer's is not about someone losing their keys or repeating stories over and over again. It's really about my mom, Judy, losing her dignity and her confidence. And her mind betrays her daily. She can't stop it, so she changes what she can. So basically what I'm telling you is my mom makes up shit to feel secure about herself, and as her family, we support her by pretending it's okay. <laughs> and it's okay to laugh, please do, if you want. <laughs> I'm not, no pressure. <laughs> For instance, sometimes she would talk to herself in the long bathroom mirror upstairs in her bedroom when we were at home, as if her reflection were another person. Because I'm sure to her, it was. And she'd be chatting with her new friend for like 30 minutes, so sometimes I would go to check on her to make sure she was okay, and I remember walking into the bathroom several times and she would just look at me with her hand on her hip like, Ugh, I had just interrupted her party. And I remember just smiling and slowly trying to back away and apologizing for interrupting. But in my head I thought, God, what the fuck? And then I thought, well, I don't know, Mom, good for you for being able to entertain yourself. 
because my mom, she's always had our back, mine and Amy's, and I know not everyone gets that kind of maternal love. So I feel great to be back in Chicago because I really want to catch all her Judiness before it slips away. And I don't even care now if it's mixed in with these fairy tales and make-believe. My sister and I, we're just hanging under the good until we're left with the inevitable pod person from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. In the last few years, I've shared moments that confirmed to me that I made the right decision about leaving Austin and coming back to Chicago. There are ones where I still see her as my hero as she struggles to be relevant in her own life. <laughs> For example, she chats with the detectives on Law & Order through the television. Because thanks to the TNT network, she thinks she knows them. Like, she literally will converse at Detective Lenny Briscoe, and then she'll look at me for approval. And I always approve. I'll, I'll knock myself out and throw in a couple lines, too. Because I'm always approving. I'm just happy she recognizes someone. Then there was the Disney Christmas Parade, you know, the one on Michigan Avenue, where in her mind, she knows ABC7's Ron Majors. So she made a beeline for him as he sat on a float in the staging area on Oak Street, all to yell at him in like a stage whisper, I know you. And I'm like, what you're doing? And he just turned around and gave her a thumbs up and a big smile. And I'll never forget how it just made her night. She was beaming. And it wasn't because it was Ron Majors. It was because he gave her what she craves, which is validation. But my favorite is the woman that my mom accosted at Target. Um, because obviously Judy has boundary issues. And she <laughs> sidled up to this woman and just insisted that they knew each other from St. Gertrude's Parish. And I'm always worried and afraid in these situations about some kind of rejection, you know, from the other person towards my mom. So I always like go up behind her and try and do the sign language, like just not say yes. And you know, but this woman halted me, man. Like she had it down. She knew what was going on and just kept eye contact with my mom and kept nodding and saying yes. And she actually took her hand. And for 15 minutes, they just had this great encounter. And my mom, she was just all smiles and sunshine after that. And I just, I can't tell you how thankful me and my family are for people like this who just out of the blue, when they're accosted by some stranger who thinks they know you from like some crazy parish in uh, Rogers Park, that they just smile and say, sure, you bet. And then they're the ones who've actually saved her ass, uh, like the gas station attendant in Schiller Park. At the time, we thought my mom was okay to drive until she tried to go somewhere new. So basically what I mean is she was okay to drive somewhere where she knew the route and her brain could remember that. But when she tried to meet friends at a new restaurant in Oak Park, she got lost. And she didn't call us. And when she stopped for directions, she told the gas station attendant she was fine. And she's kind of formidable, so when she says she's fine, you're like, okay, yeah. So it was actually her friends who alerted us that she had never showed up for dinner, so we were really freaked out, totally frantic. The police had to issue an APB for her, and again, I mean, God bless this gas station attendant, because he's like, I do not believe you, that you're okay, and he called the police, and they matched her up with the APB, and we got our mom back, but I don't know what would have happened if he hadn't been like, you don't know what you're talking about, lady. So it was scary, but no one was more rattled from that than my mom. She is in a memory care unit now, and it totally makes me giggle when she flirts with Richard and Tim, the only two male caregivers on her floor, because she's conveniently forgotten that she's married. <laughs> and it's not that my mom was perfect, but she is ours, and she has carefully constructed her house of lies and we participate fully, wanting her spark to be bright and her dignity intact for as long as possible. I left Austin fearful that she'd forget me, and ironically, I got all these great memories now of her. So almost 10 years into her diagnosis, the question I get most is, does my mom remember me? And the answer is no. No, she doesn't. But she smiles when I walk in, and she knows she can trust me. When she does talk now, she serves up a word scramble, and I just smile and squeeze her hand and say yes. 
it doesn't matter what words she strings together, the answer is always yes, a thousand times over, yes.